10 years from now, one sentence, what's a paramedic look like? A clinician with a clinician mindset. Can I make one other point about David's comment about shocking the system? And I think I'm sort of in the shock the system camp too, realizing that I think it's a decade long shock. From what I can tell, we've been talking for five years about how far in the future we should push this decision. Well, hell, five years ago, we could have said 10 years and we'd be halfway there now. Welcome to a very important and special edition of Medic Mindset. My name is Ginger Locke, and I'm a paramedic and EMS educator. This episode was the conception of the editorial and program director for EMS World, Hillary Gates. In response to recent position statements, she assembled a panel to discuss degree requirements for paramedics, and she was kind enough to include me in this collaborative project. We recorded from the National Association of EMS Physicians annual meeting in Austin, Texas. We were fortunate enough to have Dr. Ed Rock guide the discussion. The panelists were David Tan, Mike McAvoy, Scott Bourne, Brandon Bleese, Phil Moy, and Jason Pickett. And two of those names, J.R. Pickett and Brandon Bleese, might be familiar to regular Medic Mindset listeners because they've been on previous episodes. We did Talking Teaching with Dr. Pickett and Thinking About Chest Pain with Dr. Bleese. With the exception of the rare moments they explicitly say they are representing a larger group, you can assume they are expressing views that are only their own. To go through the bios of these panelists would be very lengthy, so I'm going to send you to the show notes at medicmindset.com to get to know them better. In the show notes, you'll also be able to find the position statements they reference. The guests in this episode are true leaders in every sense of the word, unafraid to step into heated waters to speak without hesitation about what they believe is best for paramedics and their patients. Sitting at the table with them for an hour was an absolute honor. They know what this podcast is, and they know that a group of tremendously bright and educated medics are listening. So, I leave you in the hands of the very capable and entertaining Dr. Ed Rock. My friends and colleagues, thanks for doing this. Hillary and Ginger and everyone, thanks for putting it. Together, we kind of wish you would have had a little less controversial um, podcast to start, you know, something easier related to world peace, cancer, you know, the federal government at this point. Uh, but this is, this is really, I think, an important discussion. And like almost anything that's ever happened in EMS, some of our biggest changes, some of our most important advancements in the profession and the art and the science have come out of a lot of pretty tough discussion. And this is, this is no different. The discussion today is a discussion that's really rooted in everyone's desire to move our profession to the next, next level, right? How do we, how do we prepare for the future with our providers, our colleagues in systems? And as we look at how we prepare, what's it going to be like? What are the risks of doing that? What are the perceptions of doing that? And I think um, it'll be interesting to hear everyone's uh, view on this because this is a a topic that's really bathed in a lot of perceptual um, components, right? People have a view of stuff like this that uh, is important in kind of driving where it goes. So the topic is essentially um, advanced educational requirements for um, paramedics. And I'm, maybe we can take a liberty you know, a little bit further on in the podcast to um, maybe expand that a little bit to advanced educational requirements for next generation EMS providers. So maybe it isn't paramedics, but the next gen provider level. If I can try and summarize where I think uh, the, the two components of the discussion are, um, there, there is a belief by a group of our colleagues that requiring a different educational um, content, uh, volume of education, amount of education for a paramedic would enhance the individual and enhance the profession. There is another group that feel like 
the requirement for increased amount of education, increased volume of education, would create a substantial risk to the current EMS infrastructure, our ability to respond, take care of patients today, and that there really isn't, you know, we haven't finished filling in the blanks about what that would mean. So I think, I don't know if I've kind of, you know, summarized what I think both sides of that, of that coin are. I'll throw it out to the group. If I, if I kind of threw some bookends out there, who wants to start on this very easy, non-controversial topic? <laughs> I think that a degree requirement for paramedics will advance the profession, and I think that this is the next logical step. Um, and I understand the concerns about the increased cost, but I think that overall that they're worthwhile. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence that this is the case. When you look at some of our First Nation colleagues, Canada, Australia, the UK, you look at these systems that have degree requirements for paramedics. Saudi Arabia has very common degree requirement for paramedics, although it's not, uh, it's not universal. There's two states now that uh, require a degree for paramedics entering the profession. So Kansas and Oregon, you've got to have at least an associate's degree to become a new paramedic uh, in those uh, states. We're seeing this shift in nursing with physician assistants, with healthcare professions, in fact, paramedics are the only healthcare professionals that have to make decisions based on their assessments that don't have a degree requirement. And if we want to be taken seriously as a profession, then we need to be up there with the rest of our medical colleagues in showing that with the educational standards and um, that we are playing on that same field in this specialty of pre-hospital care. I bet our friend and colleague, Mike McAvoy, has some similar opinions to exactly that, but some different perceptions about implications of that. Yeah, okay. Am I right? You are right. Yeah. So, and, and that might even be why we're all sitting here. So a, a bunch of fire service groups um, got together to uh, talk about the issue and collectively issued a statement on behalf of the uh, International Association of Fire Chiefs, the International Association of Firefighters, the National Volunteer Fire Council, the uh, National Fire Protection Association, and uh, a uh, group of uh, folks who uh, do congressional work. And they had a couple concerns. So let me say two, two things, I guess two points from uh, the fire service side, which I, I think would collectively represent what those organizations are saying. First off, the fire service is the largest provider of EMS in the United States, exceeding any other faction of the, of the service. As such, their sense about the proposal by the educators and the folks who put forth what we're talking about here in uh, pre-hospital emergency care last year has a timeline which is about five to six years out that uh, seems untenable to the bulk of the fire service in the United States in two ways. The degree requirement for an entry-level paramedic would increase hours uh, and would uh, raise the cost of educating those people. In the fire service as a whole, most of our uh, budgets are municipal budgets that really have no cushion or room to be able to expand that amount of money and time in the short period that, that we're talking about here. So that, that's the first point. And the, the second point is um, I don't think any of these organizations, and I might be wrong, but I, speaking for the International Fire Chiefs, we're not opposed to... Uh, what you were just talking about with education. We certainly agree that having paramedics hold a degree is important and would help the profession. Uh, we're not opposed to education in any way, shape, or form. There are tons of doctorally prepared fire chiefs like myself uh, you know, who, who support that in their departments. We are the organization actually that pushed a lot of the uh, co-amp stuff. You know, we're, we're the group that kind of said, let's make accreditation a requirement to get into uh, the National Registry so that you graduate from an accredited program. And all of the programs that the fire service runs in the United States are accredited. 
uh, paramedic programs, which means they have a degree track for people who want to get a degree. Uh, they have to have an affiliation requirement uh, or an affiliation agreement or a uh, collaborative agreement with a college so that somebody could get a degree. So we're certainly not opposed to that. I think the big uh, issue is the affordability and the timeline to be able to accomplish it in, in a short period of time, meaning five or six years. So I'm going to see if I learned anything on the planet in marriage counseling. The answer would probably be no. And I want to try something here. Yeah. I guess I ought to rephrase that whole thing so the whole podcast doesn't get it. <laughs> yeah, just kidding. Um, yeah, yeah. Whoa, look at the time. Nice seeing you guys. It's amazing. Um, so, so, Mike, do you disagree with what Jason said that education, better education for paramedics will lead to a more informed, if I can paraphrase, a more informed provider and would help to advance the profession? No, I don't disagree. So, Jason, do you disagree that w with that caveat, that advancing medical education, that requirement, do you disagree with Mike that there are some operational challenges as big as some of those mountains to overcome for us to realize that? Well, there's certainly uh, operational challenges, I agree. Uh, but my take is with, with the statement that if you aren't requiring it, providing it or funding it, then you're not supporting it. So it's in an effort to, so the, and let me make sure and see how marriage counseling just didn't, I should have kept the damn receipts. So um, <laughs> what I think I'm hearing you say is the challenges that the fire service has or anyone that's, that's kind of weighed in from that perspective are operational challenges along the journey. Your statement being the journey is never going to commence unless we say, Got to get the backpacks, got to get the shoes, we got to do this, or you know what, it's a lot easier to sit in a room, right, and do nothing. But the concept of a more, um, I don't want to say more educated, but a, a provider with additional education, right, um, providing care in the streets is a good one, the oh, concept. 100%. I, th I think we're completely on the same page with, yeah. Yeah. Uh, with that, you bet. So, so one of the other interesting things, and Dave and I had a cool discussion in the lobby, we always have cool discussions in, in lobbies um, uh, yesterday, I think. So there are, and Mike, you got a pile of organizations that have position paper. Um, Dave, Phil, I mean, we all are affiliated with organizations and we all speak for ourselves. But then our organizations are going to try and figure out what it means for us. So if we agree on the concept of more education for paramedics, our organizations are going to say, all right, we got to figure out what that means for the members we represent and the particular role we play in this whole journey, right? So the fire service does it through the fire side, NMSP does it through the physician side, the NMSP and professional member side, the educators do it from an educational perspective. And those organizations have significant values because they bring in this, it's like the Unimind, right? On, what was that, Buzz Lightyear? You know, mind that big, where they all get together, and that expertise helps to lay out those challenges, Jason. I think that you described is that. I mean, Dave, you are about ready to lead the largest EMS physician organization uh, around. Did I did I frame that accurately on different roles of decision making? Look at where we've come from the inception of EMS. If you think about what a paramedic was like in the 19, late 1960s, early 70s, to now, almost 50 years later, when paramedicine was, what was it, 350 hours of training, I think, they had to ask permission to start IVs. They had to ask permission to defibrillate to now where we expect them to not only interpret the 12 lead but to activate the cath lab from the field in some instances push the thrombolytics in the field we're expecting them to do so much more and we haven't even mentioned community paramedicine yet and advanced and unscheduled medical services it I, it sounds like we all agree that it's unrealistic to expect them to do that at a vocational tech level anymore. I think, I think we are definitely moving towards education. Um, but the how of that, as Mike very well said, the, the complexities of that, how do you make it so that it's not a shock to the system? Uh, how do you make it so that you are still able to fill the 
job openings in the job market. Um, in my uh, jurisdiction alone, in the next five years, we're probably going to see upwards of 500 full-time openings. As you think about it, the big boom of EMS providers, what are they doing now about 50 years late, 40 years, 50 years later? They're all retiring. How do you not shock the system but also value increased education? There has to be something that goes along with it to motivate people to get more education and then to uh, incentivize and reward that education from a monetary standpoint. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in here really quickly to, to your shock, the statement there. Um, in the pre-hospital emergency care position statement, they do reference Kansas and Oregon being kind of the grandfathers of this and speaking to Kansas City Fire Department and, you know, their paramedics as well as Oregon. I asked them, I was like, do you, are you guys having a, having a hard time getting paramedics knowing that it, they require at least an associate's degree to go to paramedic school? And the most common answer I've gotten when I've talked to them, again, this is all anecdotal. I don't have any hard numbers or objective evidence. But anecdotally, they said that's not even a question. They just do it. That's not a problem for these paramedics to get an associate's degree to, or for these potential paramedics to get an associate's degree prior to going into paramedic school. I mean, looking at Kansas and Oregon, I don't think that just requiring necessarily just an associate's degree, which was mentioned in the position statement itself, would be a tremendous shock to the system. So let me ask you a question. You're good at identifying, like in an educational or a student body or a, you know, entry level into whatever the journey is, mm -hmm. what motivates folks? What gets them, right? Uh -huh. You, in the way you talk and the way you design your podcasts, right? How do you, how do you pull people in to say, I want to listen to that? How do we as a profession, two points to the question. One is, if I'm... Um, Eddie rocked and I want to be a paramedic and I initially looked at being a paramedic and I could do it in a moderately short period of time um, and then get a really good job with an organization somewhere that, near where I lived and now all of a sudden we change it and it's now a couple years mm -hmm. right so it's it's an education it's a couple years what a do you think that will change the interest of providers who want to seek entry into our profession, part one. And part two, how would we incent them? Is that a word? Incentivize. Incentivize, yeah, because yeah. incent, no, incent. incent's like a bad word. Right, incent's a, yeah, that's a bad word. That's Are something you that you go to prison for, isn't it? That's, yeah, so we're not going to, let's not, let's not incent Yes, you don't want to go to prison, yes. Right, right. even if you don't have brothers and sisters, yes. I don't know what that is, so, yeah. So how do we, thanks for the grammar thing there, Hillary. How do we Didn't take long, in, in, yeah, dark incentivize them Very to say, I'd love to do that? So I think, I believe your first question is, how do you get someone interested in paramedicine knowing that the requirements to get into becoming a paramedic have increased where you have to get a two years associate's degree as opposed to going completing high school or going to paramedic school? I don't necessarily think that's going to detract from the attraction of being in paramedicine. And if you think about the other healthcare professions, nursing, physicians, you know, there's a large amount of schooling involved in that. And you still have this high enrollment into these professions as well. I would also buff, buff, uh, I would also add to that in that becoming a paramedic with the added associate's degree, saying, yes, we need more education, would also incentivize them in the future because if you're saying I'm getting paid minimum wage and I'm getting an associate's degree, I should get paid more because I'm getting this extra education. And in the position statement itself, they've cited, uh, I believe it's citations 32 to 35, where there was this concern about, well, what's going to come first, the chicken or the egg? Are you going to pay a paramedic more? And that's your, how you can incentivize more people to get into paramedicine or do you start the extra training and then the wage increase will occur? Those citations were specifically and interestingly, they were only economic studies. They weren't any medical studies. They're economic studies seeing higher education does what does that do for wage earning potentiality? And it showed that throughout these four studies that they reference here, that it does pressure wages to increase because the supply and demand does change. Now the supply may decrease a little bit, which you're right. 
because, oh my God, I got to do two years of my associate's degree before I do a paramedicine. But think about that in just typical economics, the inverse relationship between supply and demand. If the supply goes down, but the demand for paramedicine still is high, right? There's going to be something that's going to incentivize them. So the pressure for wage increase will increase with this added educational requirement. I'm not sure if I completely answered your question well. I think you did. And, yeah. I, and I, I guess I struggle. I think, sorry, I, yeah. profession struggles. Right. Uh, case in point, um, here in Texas, I remember a gazillion years ago when we made a decision to do licensed paramedics, and you probably recall, licensed paramedics and certified paramedics. Right. And it was a grandfathered process, grandparented process. Um, did, you guys couldn't hear it, but Hillary like <laughs> snorted behind that when I, it just happened. Did you hear the Hillary snort? <laughs> there was like a little <laughs> grunt there. Um, but the, <laughs> but the, the goal of that was to create, so the, the grandparenting process was to allow a couple of years for certified to become licensed paramedic, and then it was an educationally based, so that if it, you know, depending on, on degree, non-degree, it was licensed or, or certified. And to date, we really haven't seen exactly what you described, and I think everybody really embraces that. It's like if physical therapist did it, nurses kind of did it, although there's some debate, right, about that. Um, but we haven't seen that in Texas. So I guess, I guess the question is, how do, we, how do we work on if it's going to increase the compensation, meaning the value of the education from an individual standpoint becomes a lot more intriguing. So maybe I am going to do the associate's degree. How do we increase compensation for the individual at the end at a time period when um, the um, the profession itself reimbursement for EMS um, regardless you know the commercial payers the federal government is going down and systems are struggling to stay afloat Jason well, I wanted to add there's a 2006 study by Suzuki et al from the Journal of Occupational Health that showed degreed nurses uh, the nurses with bachelor's degrees their turnover was less than half of their colleagues without the bachelor's degrees. So if you factor in that employee cost of the training and, and the, uh, the novice providers, which are a little bit more expensive, need more oversight, all of that, then those organizations do see a cost savings by having less ter- personnel turnover. I, I would say uh, another thing, though, to keep in mind in, in this discussion, and to, to Phil's point, um, if you look at the uh, nursing profession, physical therapists, and a lot of these other groups that are cited in the paper as um, having improved wages, those places, you know, hospitals, there was a cushion. There was a place where you could draw more money from. And when the hospitals wanted more money, the nurses went with them and got more reimbursement. And the same thing happened with physical therapists. You don't have that in government. You have a municipal budget that doesn't really have the flexibility to say, okay, we're going to add more money into this. You also have a substantial cadre of volunteers. And so you take New York State, for example, 40% of New York State geographically is covered by volunteer paramedics. And so now we're saying those volunteer paramedics, um, we're going to put this requirement, additional requirement on them that could potentially have some impact on those organizations where they wouldn't be able to have individuals serving in those roles. Do you think you'd lose volunteers significant? I, you know, thinking through that in my head, volunteers love it because they have a passion for it, right, in general. They, do you think that if my barrier to entry was higher, that, you know, if I had to have a couple of years, I, I may choose to either maybe I'm I just changed to an EMT. Maybe I changed to volunteering in different. Do you think it would impact her? I think it would, and I, I I would reference that by a number of stadium mass directors that I talk to who say um, the biggest challenge that they have right now is is volunteer organizations coming to them saying there's too much requirements for training. We need that to be reduced, and. A couple of those same state directors have said to me, if I was even to suggest that there be a degree requirement, I wouldn't be the state director anymore. So I think that that, and I'm not saying that that's a a wall or a prohibition against it. I think that that's a really big obstacle 
that we would have to figure out yeah. how to overcome. Makes sense. So you're, if you're listening to this on the podcast, you can't see this. If you're watching it on Facebook Live, you can see it. Scott Bourne makes these weird movements in two different scenarios. One is he has to go to the bathroom. Two is he has something to say. And I'm, I, I knew you were just down at the hall going to the bathroom. Right. So, so, it must not so. Be that. <laughs> well, I'm glad we've got that worked out. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, just a couple of thoughts on on a number of the things that we've been talking about, one on the recruitment and retention side, but especially the recruitment side, if we all remember back to when we entered whatever profession we entered, raise your hand if the reason you did it was because of the economics and how much money you'd make. And, and I mean, as physicians, you make pretty good coin, but I'm going to predict that wasn't the driver when you joined. And I think the same is true for nursing, the same is true for EMS and so on the barriers to entry and the relationship between entering and payment. I think in our late teens and early 20s, there's a little bit of blindness to the reality of the economics of our, of our occupational choices. Those of us that have kids that have gone through college, we remember them going through that of, you sure you really want to, I've got a daughter who wants to be an artist. You sure? That's, that's going to be a hard life from a financial perspective, but it really... It doesn't impact her too too much. So I'm not sure I see that as, as a big downside on the initial entry perspective. And you want to be secure. Right? Uh, clearly. Everyone wants the, to mm-hmm. be secure in what they do, but not necessarily. That's not my ending point. Right? Correct. I, I think that's true. And I think the other point that I think is true is I think we could recruit candidates that currently wouldn't think of EMS because they want to be a professional when they grow up. And as they're looking at choices in healthcare, this one, this one doesn't get chosen because it's like, well, if I, if I don't even have to go to school, I don't think I want that. So I think we may actually have some more powerful recruitment of candidates that might bring some nice attributes to the profession. And I'm not unhappy with who's in it now, but, but I think people who aspire to a higher level of performance would, I think, self-select into programs that required a little bit more education. Mike's point about State Department directors and the impact on, on uh, volunteers, as Ed will undoubtedly point out at some point, I've been practicing for a while. I can remember in Colorado, where I live, when the decision... Hitching the horses up to the ambulance to go on a call? I actually have, no. I actually have photos of that. Thanks for <laughs> pointing that out. I think I was 32. That's right. We, we got the autos when I turned 33, as I recall. I, I think I've mentioned I don't, really don't like you very much. But, but, um, and that's about it for uh, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Good night, everybody. But there was a point in time when you could be an advanced first aid provider in Colorado and be a volunteer firefighter, EMS responder, and that sort of thing. And back in, I would, my memory is maybe mid-70s, mid to late 70s probably, the state began to move because then we had a workforce that was being created by EMT programs. So suddenly you had people who had that training. You had programs across the state that could deliver it. And the decision was made at some point in that time frame to go to EMT as the basic requirement if you were going to transport patients. If you were going to responder, you didn't have to do that. But if your fire department volunteer or paid was going to transport, and I can remember huge dire consequences of of death in small communities no one would and we just didn't see that now that didn't mean it was easy to recruit for volunteers but the reality is i don't think it's ever been easy to recruit for volunteers so i think change brings out one response to change is fear fear that the workforce will disappear fear that um, people have more invested in getting that job than they'll ever get back fear that there won't be enough care providers. I also went through the, the stage of nurses going from diploma. I was just starting practicing then. And there were huge predictions of nurses were going to get phased out of hospitals because they were too expensive. And those things just didn't happen. The fear, I think, is a good thing to have to look for potential consequences. But I'm not sure it's a good reason to make decisions. I think you're spot on with that. And I think um, if we do this right, sorry. When we, and we being our profession, um, when our profession does this right and has 
tough discussions like this about the journey and how we're going to get there and, you know, what's going to motivate people? How are we going to keep, you know, our current operational you know, programs under declining revenues and fixed budgets, how our organization is going to adopt it. If we do it right and we have a unified voice, I think we've learned, I hope we've learned that in EMS. If we have a unified voice, no stopping us. When we're fractured, to your point, then change becomes you know, so painful that we latch on to change and say, you know what, the locusts are coming in and this is oh, I never. Just heard them. Yeah. I just heard <laughs> oh, them, they're here. That, ooh, that was good. Yeah, hang on one second. <laughs> so, so I think you're right in yeah. that. Dave. Uh, he's absolutely right. When this happened in, with nursing, there were those yeah. concerns and those very valid fears, but you know, thankfully they didn't turn out. I think, I think in a very real sense, we may be at that same juncture with paramedicine in that we're finally beginning to realize that this is way more than just a, a technician skill. We, I don't think we're going to go backwards, in other words, from what we expect paramedics to do today. I think we're only going to move forward, expect them to know more, to do more, to have responsibility for more, especially as the healthcare landscape changes and we reshape the way we use paramedics in modern America. And that also means that employers, to include mayors, city councilmen, uh, municipalities, they have to quit looking at paramedics as a glorified taxi service as well, which unfortunately I think some do because they just don't understand the work that's done. And know that these are medical professionals, and as you always have said, EMS is a practice of medicine the way we are expecting them to function now. So not only do we have to expect our providers to expect more of themselves and also embrace more education, but also for the employers to say that has value societally. We have to go beyond it, recognize it, and then we have to reimburse it as well. Yeah, that makes sense. So I have a hard question. Can I give you a hard question? <laughs> um, which I really like giving to Scott normally because he like, you know, <laughs> that's the third reason he twitches. Um, when we talk about more education, we talk about expanding that education, that value at the other end. What is that value? What do you see as, you know, is it mobile integrated health? Is it um, identifying patient populations that can be navigated differently? Is it intervention? Is it procedures? Is it more diagnostics? I think, you know, I, you know, Dave, when you were kind of going through, look at what's changed. You know, I, I look at what Greenville, uh, South Carolina is doing, giving antibiotics in the field for presumed sepsis. And of course, that, that open other uh, departments, that opens your mind and you go, well, crud, there's a whole host of things you could do. What's your I mean, what could be that landscape of what is this? What's the value that we could potentially create in, you know, more education? Other than I bet, I bet we all agree a thousand percent that more education, the, the soft part of more education is we become better thinkers. We, we can navigate through them you know, problems better regardless of what they are because education exercises us to do that. But thoughts on what's that big the big picture. Well, I think big picture is obviously as we've these are healthcare providers, what's patient outcomes, right? So we look at you know as Dave said the change over time, right? So we've identified more and more time critical diagnoses, right? Over time, you know whether it be STEMI, stroke, trauma, sepsis is kind of the new hot item, right? We talked about you know antibiotics in the field and whatever else there may be, you know to identify some of these are very cryptic diagnoses. They're not slam you over the head right there. So I think that's where your educational value comes in as well, is that the earlier we can intervene on some of the things, we know we have better outcomes. We have data to support that. So the education comes in with teaching that kind of cryptic diagnoses. Um, we look at, you know, we talk kind of parallel with the physician world. We have residency after medical school. We know these conditions, but then the residency helps you hone that skill into emergency medicine or surgery or whatever it may be. We kind of create more value into a specific area. And I think that's where EMS kind of might struggle a little bit too is with some of this stuff is 
you know, the glorified taxi service of you call, we haul, where if we start navigating to alternative destinations or STEMI centers, stroke centers, that type of thing, mm-hmm. making sure patients get to where they need to be. And I think that's where your outcome lies is patient outcomes. In, integrating in with <coughs> the big picture healthcare system. Exactly. And doing more to either help navigate or doing more to help definitive care. I mean, I think that's the other, I think Correct. what I hear you saying, yeah. you know, we've, we've often EMS said, you know, we will transport to definitive care. And I think we're at a point where we say, well, hell no. I mean, <laughs> when you hit 911, we ought to be definitive care. And that is we, you know, we start working on identifying the problem, <laughs> fixing the problem and getting the patient to the next well, level. Of and some of those care. I think is could be where you take the tertiary care center to, to the patient. Yeah. You know, you know, we talked about definitive care. You know, how how can we get the tertiary care center to the patient sooner? Yeah, big trailer. I mean, that's a big. <laughs> those buildings are so yeah. heavy. It's a huge. <laughs> yeah, and speaking of heavy rescue units, Mike. <laughs> Probably the wrong uh, group to throw this out to, uh, doctor, 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 doctor. But um, one th- one thing that occurs to me in this discussion, uh, and I and I've had uh, probably more phone calls in the last uh, couple weeks than I've had uh, in in the last few years. Uh, but uh, but I was talking to a, a really sharp uh, educator from Tennessee um, uh, last week, and uh, he, he was talking a little bit about how the evolution and we've heard it around the table here the evolution in other professions happened and uh you know i got into nursing about the same time as scotty Mm -hmm. and and we florence nightingale was right after you guys yeah (laughs) yeah right i I, I actually dated her for a while i thought so (laughs) we knew she had visual impairment (laughs) issues no doubt absolutely And if you remember what, if you remember <laughs> what what drove that, yeah. If if uh, I took my Anzim at this morning, so uh, <laughs> what drove that was uh, the increase in education on the educator side, and so we saw a requirement to be a program director for a nursing school go from uh, a master's prepared person to a doctorate. A clinical instructor uh, needed to be master's prepared, and as a result, they set a, they role modeled an example that made people want to improve their education, and I think that we're in a way we're kind of lacking that to some degree on the EMS side of the house. And th- th- yeah, exactly. And then, like this this educator I was talking to from Tennessee is finishing his doctorate, and he has a bunch of clinical staff who in. I haven't seen too many paramedic programs where, uh, you know, they're not taking Joe Blow off the street and saying, why don't you come out and, you know, teach the the lab today? And those are not educators. Those are not people who are, are setting an example for what we're talking about here. And, and I t- you're absolutely right. I totally forgot about that whole trend. It was really, a, it was a controversial time. I remember, you know, the the concept of, you know, what what's, it's, you know, much like, what's the advantage? What do we do? And then it, and it was worked through, but it did start at the educational piece. But let me let me backtrack. Do you think we, and this is one of those questions that you know what the answer is going to be, do you think we as a profession are consistent in our educational approach nationwide, not state by state, but if I am a paramedic in Austin, Texas, or you're a paramedic in Missouri, or you're a paramedic in Colorado, you're a paramedic in Nevada, have, could, do people look at us and say, your educational background, I know pretty much what it is. I know pretty much what your credentialing process was. I know pretty much what your scope of practice is. And I know who you are and what you can do. Do you think we have that now? To your point, Mike, I think, you know, are we you know, the, the educators became, they changed, they morphed the educational system on the nursing side. Are we as a paramedic body nationally, is a paramedic, a paramedic, a paramedic the same, or do we still have to fix that? Or do we even have to fix it? Or is it better to have differences? Answer that. Uh, (laughs) Why, thank you. (laughs) I think I have to go to the bathroom now. Too late. You got uh, another question. That's the wiggle. You know, I think we're better. I think we're substantially better. I mean, I can remember when I became a program director in Colorado, uh, 
and I think it was Texas that was still in the low hundreds of hours of training in comparison to Colorado, which was in the seven, eight, nine hundred hours of training for a paramedic. And then in my early years at AMR hiring paramedics, there was a ginormous difference between paramedics that would hire up from Texas was one of them I remember specifically. That was a long time ago. And Colorado. I don't see that dramatic diversity anymore. There is still diversity, but I don't see it, you know, the compact, the state compacts between the states, the uh, uniformity of credentialing, which quite honestly, as controversial as it was, its purpose was to do what we're talking about, which was to start to equalize out programs a little bit. I don't think we're clear there, but I think we're maybe 80% of the way there. And the public is 100% of the way there. They think we're all trained the same and uh, that if they get a paramedic in Colorado, they'll be equivalent. And it's probably important to think about the people that trust us, whether we're fulfilling on that trust. Interesting question based on that. I, I look at, uh, I think, you know, if you look at our critical care paramedic journey in the EMS world, and we've not done a good job with that. I mean, it is... It is so different from state to state. There are so many different rules, regulations, cultures that change that background. So a critical care paramedic in Texas would be so totally different than critical care paramedic in California, anywhere else. The programs are different. MIH fits into that category, I think, that, you know, an MIH medic is different from state to state because we haven't really created consistency. It seems to me there's two, two ways we provide educational tools for our colleagues and ourselves. One is the initial education, and the other is continuing education. The critical care medic program system, arguably the highest clinical intervention piece of what we do, was built by the current paramedic baseline entry and then continuing education on top of that. Is there value in looking at that in this discussion. So I guess my question is, which I'm not articulating very well. Shh. <laughs> don't you? Yeah. Um, it, it's, paper. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, well, <laughs> so, but my question is, is, is the educational requirement that we're all talking about, is that isolated to entry level education? Or is that something that we look at as on top of that entry-level education, that continuing education, continuing credentialing to create that level of provider. I think you bring up an interesting point because I agree with you. Critical care paramedics, in, even in the state of Missouri, is all different. Dr. Tan's got critical care paramedics in his ground EMS system. In my flight EMS system, we have different requirements than he does. So even in the same state, it's completely different. In the same city, completely different. Often in Often. the same vehicle, right? I mean, Often the same hey, where'd vehicle. where'd you go? I, no. Or the same aircraft. Yeah. yeah. Or by time of shift. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Time of shift. I think the value of this conversation, especially with all the different viewpoints and, and Mike representing the IFF and all the fire protection uh, unions and whatnot, is essentially small steps – to get to the big picture. And I think the small step of requiring this initial associate's degree or an advanced degree to go to paramedic school is the right first step. And I think from there, we can cascade forward. I think it will be part of the conversation in the future. I just don't think we should all do it at once. I think one step at a time with, with caution to make sure that we don't shock the system, as Dr. Tan has said. So it's... Go ahead. I think we should uh, shock the system. Uh, and I'm going to say, well, we've, we talked, you said, you talked about this being a, a threat to the current model of practice and a shock to the system. What, look at the model of EMS right now. It's a rubber stamp, and that rubber stamp is ambulance, and inside of that, the, it says paramedic. And we say, let's use that rubber stamp, and we'll just use more rubber stamps. It's no wonder that this model is unsustainable, and it's not just the rural volunteer-covered areas that we're talking about, but even in uh, heavily funded municipal areas, this is not a sustainable model. Because we've looked for homogeneity in our systems, like let's get everybody trained the same and we want paramedics to be doing the same. And we, we, we train the paramedics for these critical procedures, but that's not the majority of what they do. 
So this pressure now might be the opportunity to shock the system and say, let's work on getting what the patient needs to the bedside. Not simply a paramedic staffed ambulance within eight minutes, 59 seconds of every 911 call covering every single square block of the United States of America. And this is that financial pressure that, that we're seeing. So we say, well, we can't possibly do this. We can't support uh, this education requirement. Well, then let's build a system that works. Uh, and the, to build the system that works is not diminishing the education requirements. The, the, the system that works is looking at where we need to be at the end uh, and envisioning where that is, and then how do we, uh, how do we get there? And I think until we start rethinking how we are providing EMS, it's going to be a circular argument, and the city leaders, the chiefs, they're going to be saying, "Well, we can't, we can't afford all this um, to have all all of these paramedics." The question is, do you need to have paramedics there? Same argument with trauma centers. You're out in a rural area. We'd love to put trauma centers covering all of these rural areas because we know that that is a time-dependent critical intervention in those patients who need it. But the fact is it's not sustainable to do that. So we have to build that system with that in mind with something that we can sustain. And JR, I, I tell you, I totally agree with you. I, I, I wouldn't say that I'm a, I would be against shocking the system, so to speak, by suddenly requiring the degree requirement. But I also know that when you have so many disparate stakeholders with a lot of other obstacles and barriers, that's simply something that we have to consider. In a perfect world, yes, I would love to say, let's raise the bar immediately now and make a degree requirement or higher educational standards the, the norm tomorrow. I just know that that's probably not entirely realistic, but I do think that we should be moving that way. And I think something else you said, which is really good, which is we often train paramedics for that low frequency, but extremely high risk, immediate uh, life threat call, which thankfully doesn't happen every single 911 call. But then it goes back to assessment and that educational paradigm that allows them to recognize what really is a life threat and what isn't. And I would go so far as to say that, well, if it would be easier to say, well, let's not say that you have to have a, a two-year degree or associate at the minimum to go to medical school, but that paramedic school is your associate, you can come in and say, when you finish paramedic training, we're going to give you a little bit more and you will graduate with an associate degree in paramedicine and then can therefore be credentialed to, to work. Even that would be a tremendous step forward in saying, we think you practice more than just you call, we haul. We think you practice medicine and you need to have the, the basic fundamental, not only knowledge base scientifically, but that, that whole cerebral academic um, diagnostic approach to patients that sometimes you just can't cram into 12 months. The critical thinking skill. And, you know, when I see problems or calls that kind of went sideways, it, typically it's not because of a lack of knowledge. A lot of times it's because of that disconnect between what they're seeing and what, how they connect the dots to come to a final di diagnosis. It's that critical thinking piece, which is part of what education gets to do. It makes you think uh, in complexities and parallel in, instead of linearly, which sometimes I think we, we expect paramedics to just follow some flow, easy flow chart. And, and there is no flow chart, as you said in your talk, for the two o'clock in the morning person stuck underneath the truck on an icy roadway kind of thing. You, you, you really have to learn how to make some critical decisions when you don't have an obvious protocol in front of you, which is where I think some of the value of more school comes in. I'll add, too, that the, it, the 1966 model of EMS that we're using, in that half century, the healthcare system in this country has uh, it, it evolved logarithmically. We have so many resources now for patients that don't include take them to the ER. And our paramedics are currently in the patch mills and the minimum standard programs very poorly prepared to assist the patient in navigating that healthcare system. And 
we have this, it's, you know, we just do the thing in the, in the pre-hospital setting. And I had this conversation once with uh, a guy and he said, well, it, you know, at the end of the day, you just, you got to take them to the hospital so the doctor can do the doctor thing. And I looked at him and I said, you're the problem. <laughs> uh, because that, that's a, uh, no, no, it wasn't, but man, I, it, it like, this is, this is the issue. We've, we've got so many resources that we can help our patients with and just crushing the ERs with more patients of here, solve the problem. And more and more these days, 911 is that solve my problem phone number. Like, you know, I don't know how to do this, but with the home health and community health and clinics and mental health and all of this stuff that doesn't include the ER or a trip to the hospital, we need to prepare our medics better for helping our patients navigate that system. Yeah, I, I, your, your points are really well taken. I think what's changed from that initial model and from the way the practice used to be was we, were, we had a narrow breadth and great depth. We knew a lot about what to do with cardiac emergencies and trauma and airway problems. And uh, now the healthcare systems evolved around us. And now we need a lot of breadth and in many cases, not so much depth. Um, it's interesting, and we've done it here during this conversation. Inevitably, during these conversations, it's always about critical care and cricotherotomies and all that. And I'd offer up the biggest risk and the, and the most critical decision we make has to do with transport, no transport, and where. If we're going to err, it's not going to be because we did a critical procedure wrong, probably. It's going to be because we made an error in judgment as to who could go where. And there's, we don't have any of the breadth to allow us to make those decisions based on an understanding of pre-existing conditions, what medications a patient takes, availability of community resources, and all that sort of thing. Can I make one other point about David's comment about shocking the system? And I think I'm sort of in the shock the system camp, too, realizing that I think it's a decade-long shock. From what I can tell, we've been talking for five years about how far in the future we should push this decision. Well, hell, five years ago, we could have said 10 years, and we'd be halfway there now. So I think that's the other point, is I think if everyone's in agreement, we ought to do it, just not today, then maybe our conversation needs to shift from yes, no, to win. My memory, if memory serves me right, the nursing decision, and, and you may remember this, I think it was a decade, if I remember right, between the this is what's going to happen and when this happened. And then it oh. kept getting bumped. And, and it did keep getting bumped, but you know what? I don't mind that so much, um, just as long as it closes at some point. Because with each of those, each time it got bumped, a higher percentage of the workforce had been educated, a higher percentage of the workforce had been educated. So, you know, I think it, let's get over the go, no-go question and instead talk about timing and, and processes for grandfathering and all that kind of stuff. Scott, I think you raise a good point, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. Fair enough. <clears throat> Let's just put that off till tomorrow. It was a joke. <laughs> so, so let me ask. Oh, sorry. Scott go ahead, Jerry. Uh, a, a dream without a deadline is just a wish. And without that pressure of giving them a deadline to, to say to those who are entrenched in, the, uh, in how they've been doing things, they're not going to change on their own. Uh, without that external pressure and this – needs to happen and if we say look it's got to happen by such and such date whether that's five years from now ten years from now if we say inshallah it'll happen then it's not going to until somebody puts that pressure you can set a deadline but if you don't have any means of getting there and we've talked about a, a dozen things here today the educators and the, um, the ability to pay for it and, the, and all those obstacles i think are issues that have to be addressed. And, you know, another thing I would throw out, too, is we're looking at programs that are accredited programs now that are producing, theoretically, uh, medics who have entry-level competence, you know, that we're confirming that they have that competence. And this is a discussion that we're, you know, focused on heavily at the National Registry right now, who, whose board I sit on. and And I don't know that giving those people general education requirements on top of that is necessarily consisting of anything 
that would be the same between one community college and another. You know, I think there's community colleges where those extra 24, 30 credits might be basket weaving and they might be some critical thinking things, but there, there absolutely is no consistency to that. There is in the nursing side. Mm -hmm. There are some things that they say, okay, these are courses that you need to do. There is in the physical therapy side, but that's another issue that needs to be addressed and say, if we're going to require this as, as a degree requirement, then what are we going to tell these community colleges that they need to do? Because that, that's lacking right now. There's critical thinking in basket weaving. <laughs> Over versus under. Over versus under. <laughs> exactly. Type of <laughs> well, yeah, I'd be interested in putting Mike on the spot a little bit and say, it sounds to me like the international and I chiefs are not opposed, as you said, to more education. But then what, what then would it look like to make it acceptable from your organizations to say, because JR's point is absolutely spot on, that which is you know, we, we have to stop talking about it in the future. And as, and as Scott said, we'd have been halfway here by now if we said five years ago, let's just go. It sounds like we all agree that it's not a matter of yes, no, because we all say yes, it's the matter of the how part. What would make it more palatable or more acceptable to say, yes, we're going to start? Well, okay, I'll be on the spot. Uh, Thanks. <laughs> there, I, I would say, okay, first let me just uh, clarify so that I don't get a death threat later tonight. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Phil, I'm not talking for IAFF. <laughs> I can speak for IAFC, but I can't speak for IAFF. But I, I think there's three things. I think um, the, first, the first issue uh, that, would, that would be a major concern is uh, how do we pay for this and how do we pay for it in a system that's primarily municipal, you know, dealing with municipalities and with localities and their funding methodologies, you know, how, how would we actually afford to pay for that, that extra cost? The second piece is a time piece. I'll be, the, here come the locusts, uh, I'll, I'll be quite blunt about this. There's a faction in uh, the fire service that honestly believes that uh, the educators are attempting to edge the fire service out of their own educational programs. And, and I think any of us here at the table who are familiar with paramedic education know that uh, the fire service is very clever in the, the way that they have uh, set up programs so that they can train their own paramedics. And they do it largely, again, for a cost thing, but they have time. You know, they have these people that are on shifts, and the shifts are weird sorts of shifts, and they want to train them to become paramedics on their schedule, not on the community college's schedule. And so there are multiple, 19 of them actually, fire department-based paramedic programs. And there is a paranoia that this is a move by educators to drive them out of that and say, uh, you can't do that anymore. So that time factor uh, is, the, is the second big obstacle, I think, that how, how you would pay for this. And then the time piece, how you would make it so that we could still accommodate the schedules that are necessary for those uh, municipal departments to do. And then the third big piece really is, how do we address this issue uh, of the volunteer segment without um, having an uprising from folks like the National Volunteer Fire Council that says, you know, all of our members are volunteer and all of our paramedics are volunteer and we're gonna lose uh, service in, in small communities across the country if we put this as a, as a requirement. How do we overcome that? I don't think any of those obstacles are absolutely impassable, but I think they require a lot of thought as, as to how we would do that. So. And I appreciate a ton Dave's question because I think, um, you know, if, so again, when we do this right for the next step in EMS, our EMS profession, whether we're fire-based, volunteer, career, non-governmental, air, ground, water, you know, when we do this right, it means that we all have to say it's the right thing to do from an educational standpoint, it's the right thing to do from the individual provider standpoint, and it's the right thing to do from an organizational standpoint. And uh, IFF unfortunately couldn't be here, but they did send, and Lori Moore um, did send, they've got a position paper. And, you know, some of the language, Mike, to your point on um, their resolution is that the IF opposes eliminating the certification or licensure option you know, to become a paramedic. And further, that the IFF supports that the certification licensure option, along with an associate's degree, 
um, option can be maintained as a means of ensuring quality emergency medical care while maintaining access for anyone seeking paramedic education. So I think the language here is, right, if I'm, if I'm interpreting it correct, it's not saying, ah, we're not going to do it. It's saying operationally, we got to figure out the implications of this. We got to figure out how to take care of our communities and define budgets. But, but we want to do it in a, in a thoughtful way that works from a, from, uh, across the board, across different agencies. What, what comes to mind, and we did in Texas, I bet your states did two freestanding emergency departments. Freestanding emergency departments, I mean, those were like those in Texas, like those blue bonnet seeds, right? You throw them in your yard, and the next season, your, you know, your neighbor's house is in, in just engulfed in blue bonnets. Uh, not that I've ever done that before. <laughs> but so, so the concept, the idea of a freestanding emergency department is like, this is brilliant. It's better access, right? It is better referral back into the home network. We'll get care out. But at the end of the day, more emergency care will be better for our community. So unfortunately in Texas, and I think some other um, states, um, it's, they're struggling. And they're closing at record numbers because the operational model didn't work out, right? It didn't, didn't integrate with the system. I don't think anyone would disagree that you get the right credential provider in a facility with the right equipment, and you're in my rural area and I don't have to go all the way into the mothership. That's good, but it didn't work because operationally it kind of, you know, fizzled and, and, sorry, it's struggling. Not that it didn't work. It's struggling because it still needs to find what normal is, and there was an agreement across the board on that. I'm going to do this, if okay with you guys. I'd like each of you to kind of, you know, what's your final parting message, and then I want to ask each of you two questions at the end real quick. Jara, we'll start with... Oh, you started, didn't you? I did. All right. Dave, you're up. (laughs) I have to actually say that I'm very heartened that we actually have a lot more in common, I think, than we thought we did maybe at the start of this discussion. It sounds like we all are in agreement that paramedicine deserves and could could benefit from more education and there's value in it. The hard part is going to figure out how to do it so that those barriers that were brought up today are not um, a deal breaker, so to speak. But I'm, I'm very encouraged that um, it's, I, th- I think the, that, that gap is not as wide, I think, as I was originally thinking. So that's, that is encouraging. Uh, I would say... Um I am shocked at the uh, conversation that this has generated. Uh, In a good way? It, well, right. no, I'm just surprised that uh, <laughs> there's been so much attention to this this statement because it seemed to me nationally, yeah, it seemed to me when it came out that, uh, I mean, the iChiefs had put this statement out probably three or four months prior to the one that, uh, you know, seemed to uh, be the shot heard around the world. And uh, ours was a little bit more benign uh, in a sense of being optimistic that that we could do this and that we could achieve this uh, over a a longer course of time uh, with a lot of help. And I I think that, uh, you know, my my personal opinion and I think the opinion of the IGES is that uh, this is something that that, uh, we can work together on and, and, you know, we can – we can accomplish and, and we can move the, the profession forward. And I would say, too, that uh, the, the, the International Fire Chiefs has always been committed to that and will remain committed to that and will do what we need to do in order to, uh, as, as I said to my folks when they said, uh, you know, should we um, back down on this a little bit since it seemed to uh, gain so much ire? And uh, I said, this is not a time to back down. This is a time to lead. Uh, I'll echo David's optimism. I think it, we're closer than I thought. I was all prepared to explain why we needed it, and all of a sudden it doesn't seem like that's the, that's the discourse now, which is cool. The thing I'd encourage us to do is as we get ready to figure out what the next step is and how we time it out and everything, I think our voices will be most uniform if we stay focused on why aligning the educational preparation of the clinician better meets community and patient needs, then if we align around it's better for the industry, it offers higher pay for the practitioners, it uh, gives you a better badge to wear. But if instead we stay focused on 
on the clinical and the community output, I think all of our organizations believe in those values, and that may be a good place to start. I think I'll echo again that we are close. I think, you know, it's one of those things, it's probably, you know, the 90-10 rule, or 90% of this is agreeable, that everyone kind of is here, it's just how do we get that other 10%. I think that 10% probably comes down to logistics, is what we've talked about. And logistics kind of is everything. If you look at everything in healthcare, even outside of healthcare, you know, you look at some of these companies like an Amazon, what makes them separate from other companies that do the same thing? It's their logistics of it and how they get that done. And I think that's the next steps of how do we move from the bar. EMS is kind of a baby in the medical world, right? So there's growing pains. And I think growing pains are good. They force us outside the comfort zone. It's just how do we get to that next level? Um, I'll start with a quote. A mind needs books like a sword needs a whetstone. Does anybody know where that's from? I'm going to show my nerdiness here. I know gingers. No? (laughs) A mind needs books like a sword needs a whetstone. No? You're not as big of a nerd as I am. (laughs) Tyrion Lannister from Game of Thrones. I know. I'm a nerd. (laughs) No, I, I love the fact that everybody around the table, we all agree, is um, we all agree that more education is always a good thing. And to paramedics out there who are listening on Facebook Live and to this podcast as well, know that we all support what you do, and we realize there are nuances to paramedicine that require critical thinking that higher education can help you exercise and, and get stronger with more critical thinking with the field of paramedicine. Now, how we get there, I agree, is going to be a little rocky. I, I'm encouraged that we're not at the if but when stage at this point in time. And I'm very glad that Mike's here to give the, his point of view and the I Chief's point of view to provide some caution. Be like, let's not jump right now. Let's, let's see what we got to do, but let's go, but go slowly till we get there. And I think that that opposition of let's do it to let's 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 do it but let's do it slowly is a nice kind of meeting point and a moderate pathway to get to where we need to go and where we need to go is more education for our paramedics to to reach the level that the rest of our healthcare providers are at i am last and so i'm going to be less optimistic uh here (laughs) so uh, it's it's fine to say we support higher education standards and that's something we can all agree on but i think it's kind of hollow to say that it's like saying i support the troops and then doing nothing to support that it has to come with tangible support with legislation with requirements with pressure to do so because otherwise then that's all you're doing is saying, oh, yeah, I, I support higher education. Like, okay, are you going to fund that? Are you going to acquire that? Are you going to do anything with that? If not, then it's not going to go anywhere. It's going to be, again, no, inshallah, it'll happen. Somebody will do it uh, somewhere. So in order to move this bar forward within our own organizations, and as much as we can advocate for, we have to advocate for not simply supporting it, but requiring it. And... Uh, I'm not ignorant to the constraints that uh, that that uh, brings with it. I certainly appreciate that. Um, but if you're so constrained that we can't bring that standard to the system that we're in, let's change the system. Let's change how we're doing business there. We've often said, well, we just got to get a paramedic there. But we've pushed so many of these time-critical treatments down to the BLS level. Let's make better use of that. And so many systems, our BLS providers are being marginalized. And they shouldn't because so many of the things that will save your life in the next five minutes are in the hands of those providers. So let's make better use of them and, and, and let's redesign those systems if we can't support Uh, educating the paramedics to where we think that they should be. So here's the question. I think you've answered it in one sentence. Ten years from now, I'm going to start with you. Ten years from now, one sentence, what's a paramedic look like? A clinician with a clinician mindset. Phil, ten years. Batman, no. (laughs) (laughs) Yes! I would join that system. (laughs) Because you get the belt. Yeah. You get the belt. The utility belt. There's a utility belt. I mean, 
I agree. A clinician with a requirement for an associate's degree to get into paramedic school, at least. I would say, <laughs> I mean, my vision would be in 10 years, a, a paramedic would look like uh, a, a much more um, consistently educated clinician. I'd say uh, in 10 years, I'd like to see paramedics as skilled clinical navigators. Nice. Who can help our patients get to the right place, whether it's an ER, clinic, stay at home. Virtual uh, clinical camp? Yes. Yeah. Sky, sky clean. <laughs> nice. What about you? No, you can't do that. Um, so it's interesting because I've always loved the clinical, you know, the practitioner component. I, I would see them as the comprehensive practitioner that helps to provide the out-of-hospital definitive care that integrates with the system. That that's the individual, he or she's the king or queen that says, you know what, this is how we do this appropriately with a cool response vehicle. Those four sentences. <laughs> well, it's not. Those are, uh-uh. There were, those were commas or semicolons, right, or colons, or, and there was parentheses, unquote, period. I want to know what Ginger's thoughts are on this. Oh, She's yeah, climbed cool. inside the minds of so many great clinicians, you and go. you can use as many sentences as you want. <laughs> I would love to know what your thoughts are. On this. Thank you for asking that, and it's awesome to have a chance to talk with you guys. I've loved that. I've been nodding the whole time. Um, so thank you for indulging this. And Hillary, thanks for assembling an awesome team of just great brains around this table. Um, what is a a paramedic in 10 years look like as I educate medics my goal my wish for them is that they go out into the field and that they have longevity in that profession and what we know in most industries is that education is what allows you to continue to um, promote within an industry and um, it creates a chain of a kind of uh, of growth so that's what I would hope for is um, paramedics that can make a a career, a livelihood, a lifetime of being a, a paramedic. Nice. So I thank you tremendously for being willing to jump in to a controversial discussion. Um, I'll tell you what I love. I love that this, Mike, to your point, this has been a passionate, what the hell is this discussion all of a sudden in our profession? And I love the fact that we can sit in this room with different backgrounds, different perspectives, different goals, because everyone's got a goal, in either organizational or personal goal, and we can have the hard discussions and ask the hard questions and be productive at coming up with answers. When we are successful, it's going to be meetings just like this, where we can sit down, high five, go have a couple beers afterward, and say, that was hard. That was really hard. Because, now quotes, because every action has an equal and opposite reaction. I had a little science training. Yeah, yeah. there, Isaac Newton, there he is. Oh, such a geek. Oh, yeah. But the equal and opposite reaction is important for us in this. Because like the freestanding emergency departments, like critical care, like mobile integrated health, um, like everything we've done in medicine, we need to realize that big changes that are hard, that are really good, for a component of the system are going to have effects on other components. And when we sit down and sort those out together, then EMS takes its next step even better at managing our communities. And to your point, becomes yet a more intriguing and inviting profession that the best um, clinicians and the best people will say, I'll tell you what, here's what I want to do when I grow up, and I want to make it my life's career to be a part of it. Not only to mention that, but it is really cool hanging with all of you. <laughs> and you too, Hillary. You, yeah. By the way, you can't see this. Ready? There's Hillary. So um, appreciate it a ton. Happy Wednesday evening. And uh, Phil, how do you normally end these things? No. How do you? Beans belong in chili. Beans belong in chili. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Thank you all very much. And as you talk, remember to get really tight in on the mic. Who's Mike?